the Audi e-tron GT RS. And because this is Savage Geese, we're the last people on planet Earth to do a video on this car. So we're gonna keep it brief. We're gonna be talking about how this compares to some of the other legacy OEMs EVs. And of course, as mechanical twin, which it shares about 40% of its parts with, the Porsche Taycan. Now, before we head into the shop and talk about the mechanical tidbits, let's talk about the exterior and interior. Starting with the exterior styling, this is obviously a huge pro of the Audi e-tron. It looks very striking, arguably the best looking Audi product currently sold other than the Audi R8. And I will say the thing I most appreciate about the styling, both on the exterior and interior of this car, is it does not look like a science project. And that's one of the pros of the Audi's approach to building an EV versus many of its other legacy competitors like Mercedes. When you look at the interior, at least the styling and the usability, this looks like a traditional product. It takes all of the pros of being a Porsche or VAG Audi product. Everything's incredibly well screwed together. The fit and finish is excellent. The material choice, while it is not the most exciting, feels and looks high quality. And of course, all of the usability of this car is very good, at least when it comes to some of the ergonomics. This feels like a traditional Audi product. So if you're coming from something like an Audi R8, an RS7, or an S6, there is essentially no learning curve to getting into this car and just driving it normally. When it comes to the seats, these are the optional heated, cooled, and massage seats. They are excellent, very comfortable, good adjustability. Steering wheel is right out of all the other RS Audi products. And when it comes to infotainment, it's running Audi MMI. It's easy to use. Your HVAC controls are physical. Your basic control structure of this car is all very logically laid out. And this is the big pro over, say, the Porsche Taycan, which sort of leaned into the let's add touch screens because this is an EV. This maintains a lot of the legacy controls that make Audi products so good. The big con to this car is, well, it's not really a ground up EV architecture. They took some of the legacy components found in the Porsche Panamera and modified the suspension architecture to make it an EV. So some of the packaging, at least in the interior, is compromised. You don't really have a frunk, the trunk space is not big, and the rear seats aren't the most usable. I do not fit behind myself comfortably. My head is a bit canted in the back and you don't have the most legroom. This is really more of a coupified sedan than a true usable four-door product. And the visibility, while it isn't bad out the front, the rear is a bit compromised and the windows in this car aren't the largest. So visibility is definitely a con. With that all said, let's head in the shop and put this thing up on the lift. The Audi RS e-tron GT jack, let me get out my meter, because if I'm getting too much electromagnetic interference off this from these battery packs, I'm going back to my V8. Is it gonna take out your pacemaker? Yeah. <laughs> It is with a heavy heart we gather here to remember Mark, a man who brought several people enormous joy. While we can get caught up in his failings uh, medically, brain death is, is the ultimate silence of consciousness, is not a mere shutting down. Uh, it's an internal quietude, rendering the body a mere a shell void of the essence of being. Let us ponder Mark's tragic fate with the magnificent epitome of vehicular artistry, the Chevrolet Corvette Z06, a manifestation of unparalleled mechanical brilliance and exquisite combustive fidelity. This glorious chariot of fire and steel is a testament to refined power and reliability, a beacon in the dark seas of unpredictable and unproven electric wonders. The Corvette Z06 could have been his guardian against the erratic spirits of nascent technology. So, as we bid adieu to Mark, let his silent cerebral symphony serve as a stark warning against the follies of untested electric whispers, and may his soul find the tranquility in realms unknown.
So this e-tron GT is the RS model. It's the most expensive one. It starts at about $150,000. And okay. the reason you're spending all that money, Mark, is it's 637 horsepower in boost Let, mode. Let's just stop right there. $160,000 for this. Yeah, I think this one is tested is even more because it's got the ceramic brakes. Okay. I think the problem with this product and the Taycan, particularly after we've driven things like the Lucid, mm -hmm. Air and Sapphire, and of course the, uh, I hate to say the Teslas as well, is a lot of these legacy OEMs like Audi, like Porsche, are taking platforms and essentially modifying them and making them EVs. So let me backtrack. The, the e-tron GT, both in the RS and the regular variant, are built on Porsche's platform known as J1. If you want to learn everything there is to learn about this car, go watch those videos. But essentially, Audi took the electric motors, the battery packs, the, the, the cooling strategies, essentially everything the body is built on, and then 60% of the other parts are new. Exterior, interior, and specific suspension components to make it tune the way it is. So J1 is multi-link front and rear, everything's aluminum, everything's covered up. And that's the best part about this architecture is it's an Audi or Porsche platform, which means suspension tuning is some of the best. The body structure really isolates you. It's that bank vault feeling as you drive around. The e-tron rs has adaptive dampers front and rear it's got air ride it has a single rear steer motor in the back that controls both wheels and it's definitely tuned softer than the porsche products this feels like it's sacrificing some of the body control for what it is being an ultimate cruiser the con is it's got big giant wheels which means lots of road noise there is some of that harshness and the range is the big problem just like the Porsche, it's an 800 volt architecture. You're looking at a 94, 93 kilowatt hour battery with 84 usable. EPA states about 240, 230 miles of range from 100%. Real world is a little better, 260, 270. But if you keep this charge at 80%, you're looking at more like a 200 mile range. And that hurts this car, particularly the price point when you're comparing it to something like an Air or a yeah, Model S. Honestly, for what you're getting here, and, and I would say that the truth is the Audi, Audi and Porsche know how to do suspension better than anybody else. You could take this against anything, and it the, the way that they do it is really, really exceptional. And you could argue at 150,000, which it's not worth that plus that, but. The, the battery pack thing is interesting too because they have a huge buffer there, probably on the bottom end, which we're clearly not gonna test. I don't want this on a flatbed, but there's a buffer there. And then obviously that extra 10 kilowatt hours for battery degradation, which is I guess okay for the long term, but I don't see anybody buying this for the long term, let alone charging it 80% to keep the battery healthy. So you're gonna charge it to 100% to get the full range. Um, and we can talk about more of that in the drive too. All right, Mark, let's go take this for a quick drive. All right, Jack, I got my electromagnetic meter. Uh, prostate is wired in going down now. Man, I felt that shift. Ooh, man, two gears. Look, my PSA went down <laughs> point two, Jack, trending downward. So tell me, what so, are we doing here? So we're taking the, uh, not Tycon, forgive me, e-tron GT <laughs> RS for a quick drive and we're in dynamic. We have about four turns available to us in all of Illinois. Well, we could go on the closed road and really explore. Yeah, run over some people working construction. I, unfortunately, this car is not worth the uh, risk. <laughs> oh, the that. slaughter yeah. charge. I mean, this is a weird car. I think you and I talked about this off camera. This is a transitionary product, and we've said that a lot for every some, EV, <laughs> every EV, but particularly for the legacy OEMs. And now that we've spent time in things like the Model S, the Model Y, Model 3, and more importantly for our upcoming Lucid Sapphire video and Lucid Air, it's weird to see what the older brands, the legacy brands are good at and not. What this brand, Audi and really Porsche is great at is finding the perfect balance between handling, which I can't really demonstrate right now, but handling and of course ride. Like this car feels so solid. It's it's amazing at absorbing bumps. It does a much better job than like even the Lucid, mm -hmm. where it just feels like all of the the harshness from the road is absorbed by the body structure and the bushings. And it well, yes, you can feel the bumps, and it isn't like the EQS where it just feels like this is like a wobbly cloud. Mm -hmm. It's just it's like I don't know a sense of solidity that you get in this car that is really relaxing. You also have adaptive dampers you have air ride mm -hmm. you have all that shit going on rear wheel steering 
So you have all those electrical, electric mechanical systems in there on top of the electric motors. So as a part of its isolation and solidness, you're sacrificing, this car feels far more synthetic than, than the Lucid that we got out of. It feels less natural. While I would argue it is feels very responsive. It is a quick, tight feeling car. It feels like a regular Audi. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's same thing with a Taycan, really. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the thing, one thing you got out of it. It feels like you're driving a normal car, not an experiment. And they've done it well. And I, I think I said it in the shop, and if I didn't, the, my takeaway from this car is this is really, really exciting for their car in 10 years. Like, this gets me excited for their next car in 10 years when I don't have to plug this in every day and I could have a 500 mile range or whatever that means where I can plug it in at night every couple days and not have to worry about that part of it. And this would be way more enjoyable to me than having to sacrifice like the economics and the, the interior usability. Cause it's not a sports car, to be honest. It's a GT. It, it's a GT car, but it has sports car like compromises. It's st certainly not as edgy and as fun as a sports car. So it's like this luxury car, GT car thing with sports car type extreme sports car type pricing without the fun and the emotion of it and a shitty range i think my problem with this car is a it, it feels like a vehicle that is compromised by some of the legacy elements of adapting a platform j1 which mm -hmm. has a lot of panamera underpinnings to it yeah. to become an ev they're going to tell you it's an ev though they're going to tell you all the marketing and like oh well we built this to be an ev so, I mean, if that's the case, then they didn't do a good job. Like, it needs to it needs to do more. It needs to be more than what this is. It's not that efficient. It's only, when I'm normally driving this, getting like 2.7, maybe 2.9 miles per kilowatt hour. And I just want to confirm that I'm not speaking out of my ass. Yeah. But yeah, that's what you're getting when you're driving this like normally, which isn't great. And but normal Taycan and e-tron owners are saying that they are getting more than the advertised range yeah. goes to so if you're charging this to 100 percent and you're getting 240 or whatever there's some people are getting like 260 maybe 270 which is to be fair is not so bad no and it charges very quickly like 100 miles in, in 12 minutes but in a car like this that is a gt that you know you want to just sit at 80 miles an hour on the highway all day at you don't want to have to make compromises for like usability and livability. And in California yeah. and in areas where you are spending four hours in the car every day, but you're only driving 50 miles round trip, not a problem. But by out by us, and you brought up the perfect example with the air range that we had, you just drove it like a normal car. Yeah, I never thought about it. And I enjoyed the fact that I could drive it and look down and seeing that I had 400 miles of range, even after I charging it to 80% to, to keep the battery health up. Like it, it did everything this did to this. It's a GT car, the same as this is. It's the it faster in my approximation. It is faster. It is faster and it's, and it's more money. usable and it's less money. And that's what I expect out of a car like this. Not this exorbitant price tag that doesn't give me the sports car thrills other than it just being the gimmick of like, oh look, we made an electric car. We're a, we're a luxury brand. That's not enough. I will say compared to something like the Teslas and the EQS, this still, though, feels like a great driving Audi Porsche product, yeah, right? it does. I spoke to one of the you know, a Dynamics engineer at another brand. The only con that this has is at like 10 tenths, 9 tenths. Yes, this car will do four pa four wheel power slides. It's a bit snappy. Like, and I guess who really cares? Yeah. Because no one driving an e-tron GT is going to go, go flat out on a back road like this. Right. Uh, the breakaway characteristic when it regain regains mechanical grip will catch you off guard if you're being really stupid with it, but I guess it's really a minor complaint. Everything else, amazing. Yeah, I, the, the suspension tuning, the ride characteristics, the luxury car part of it, best part, but definitely I'm not buying a luxury car. I don't care as much about that. The whole balance pick, pa package is not there where it needs to be. So with that, Mark, let's head into the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the Audi RS e-tron GT. So what does this car do well? Well, unlike some of the other legacy OEMs building EVs, Audi did not take the gimmickful approach if you compare this to something like a Mercedes EQS or a BMW iX or i7. This car feels like a more normal automobile. So if you're coming from an Audi S8 or a RS6 and you get into this thing, you're gonna feel right at home. The interior space is exceptionally well screwed together what you're hoping for out of a $150,000 car. 
However, the con is the material choice and just the overall design feels like something out of an $80,000 car versus a $150,000 car. The vehicle is very expensive. It's not that efficient as I talked about earlier. And the use of space inside the interior is not that great. The back seat isn't that usable. The trunk isn't that big. I guess the issue with this car is it feels like a first generation EV. It feels like a car that Audi slash Porsche took a ICE architecture heavily modified and made it an EV. It's a vehicle that doesn't necessarily inherently take advantage of all of the good things, the good things that do exist in an EV architecture. With that said though, thanks for watching. Hope to see you soon. I knew Mark since grade school. We all thought he would be eating out of the dumpster behind a Dunkin' Donut. I remember hearing he is a big deal on social media. I checked out his videos on YouTube, showed my husband and thought, wow, he is still the same loser. But I could not sleep that night. The way he explained the steering wheel on the Mazda CX-5 was poetry. When I heard he had a side effect from an electric car, I rushed to look him up on Facebook, I sent him a direct message, and funny enough, he was in the hospital. I am not one to get emotional, but just seeing him yesterday explaining a volume knob with such charisma made me sad. It wasn't long after I found out he was faking the entire thing to get sympathy. I later checked my inbox, and he had sent a picture of his with the caption, Do you know how important I am? I make car videos. Lose my number. As pathetic as he is, I still donated $600,000 to his Patreon account because he is right. I can't wait to hear him discuss the plastic scuff plate on the next CUV he drives.